Uh, welcome to the first live Q&A on prostate cancer questions. Uh, my name is Mark Emberton. I'm a urologist. I work at UCLH. Uh, I'm also professor um, and dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences at University College London. Um, we're delighted to receive all your questions. They're, they're starting to come in already and we'll try and cover um, a range of topics. I've seen four questions already that um, address issues related to screening. That's probably the hot topic and I'm sure we'll get lots on that. Uh, and then um, other questions about the biology of disease which we'll um, cover. So with that, I'll go straight to the questions. Um, and the first one is from Chris. So thank you, Chris, for this. Um, this goes straight to the heart of the matter. This is the topical question of the moment. And Chris's question is, when do you plan to offer MRI tests to men who demonstrate prostate problems that may indicate prostate cancer? Well, we're doing that already. Um, so if you um, go to your GP and complain of um, urinary symptoms or discomfort, it's very likely that your prostate will be assessed, um, possibly with a digital rectal exam, um, almost certainly with a PSA. And if either of those are abnormal, in other words, your PSA is above the reference range for a man of your age, or the prostate feels in any way unusual, you will be referred for an MRI scan. So that's the current standard of care in the UK and probably now in many parts of the world. Uh, I think to go beyond that question into a screening question, so which is quite different, uh, which is uh, offering MRI to men who are well, who have not gone to their doctor about anything and who don't have any additional risk factors, uh, that's, that's, um, that is a question that's being addressed currently. And some of you may have seen um, some coverage last weekend, um, um, and some articles in the Daily Mail talking about a big prostate cancer screening study uh, using MRI. That looks as though it's gonna go ahead um, we'll reveal more details of that in the new year, uh, but it looks as though the UK is probably going to have one of the first screening studies using MRI, which we believe is the best test to identify disease that matters early um, in, in men who may not have symptoms, uh, as well as men who do have symptoms. So thank you, Chris, for that, and I, I hope that helps um, answer that question uh, to some degree. The screening question is, is a, a, a difficult one, and it's one that's frustrated um, sufferers, um, people with, who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, because almost everybody uh, wants to be diagnosed earlier than they were diagnosed. It's a really important question. What we do know is that the traditional methods of screening using PSA, essentially, and the old standard biopsy really wasn't that effective at identifying men early. Uh, and we were identifying a lot of disease that probably didn't matter. Uh, by bringing the MRI scan forward and using that as a kind of initial test, uh, we will select men with clinically significant disease who have abnormalities in their prostate. Um, and, but that's obviously a research program initially before it gets rolled out as a screening policy here in the UK or indeed elsewhere. Um, I've got an anonymous question next, which takes us a little bit away from screening, but, but is kind of related. And um, this individual asks, what are the risk factors for prostate cancer? Um, well, th there are two really important ones. Um, being a man, having, having male genes, um, being exposed to testosterone, um, and also age. And, and those are the principal factors that um, are related to um, prostate cancer. In fact, uh, we often say that men, if they live long enough, uh, nearly all of them will develop prostate cancer. Uh, however, only about 3% of men will die of prostate cancer over a lifetime. So you can see there's a big imbalance between what we call prevalence, the amount of prostate cancer out there, and the amount and the proportion of people that die. And, and that's how we're using tests to identify the individuals with prostate cancer that matters. Um, and we think MRI is very good at that. It overlooks the prostate cancers that perhaps aren't even cancers, uh, the so-called Gleason 3 plus 3s, uh, but misses very, very few of the larger cancers that present as lesions within the prostate. Um, now, there are other factors, and uh, Western lifestyle is clearly one of them. 
If you go to South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, the incidence of prostate cancer is very low. If that individual and their family move to, say, America, uh, within a generation or two, they approximate the rates of prostate cancer that we would expect uh, in an American population. And that is, and that's purely environment. That's moving from possibly a largely vegetarian diet, uh, low in meat, uh, low body mass index, to uh, an environment where uh, the body mass index, individuals will put on weight, their diet will change, they might be exposed also to pollutants and carcinogens that perhaps uh, they were not exposed to um, uh, in, in the country of origin. And, and, that, and that's a fact. We know that we know that, um, that through migration, prostate cancer risk changes. We're also currently very interested in different, different ethnic groups um, uh, and cultures and the prevalence of prostate cancer. Um, of, most people know that black men are predisposed, more likely to get prostate cancer. And when they do get prostate cancer, it can be of higher aggressivity. Um, and again, the precise reasons for that uh, are not known, but are currently the subject of a lot of research. Um, there's not much you can do uh, about reducing one's risk. Um, you can't change your age, um, etc. Uh, and men often ask what, what it is that they can do. Uh, and this relates to another question that we have on, on biology. Um, and, and my general answer is, um, is, is to try and adopt a, a healthiest lifestyle as possible. Uh, so I say what's good for the brain and the heart is good for the prostate. And we encourage the things that we know work. Um, and that's, you know, losing weight, exercising, eating sensibly, possibly reducing the amount of animal content in the diet and increasing the uh, amount of plant element in the diet. And if you do all those three, all those three things, your general health will improve, uh, your risk of dementia will diminish, uh, the risk of heart disease will diminish, and, and we are of the belief that your prostate health will indeed uh, be enhanced. Now, there are lots and lots of supplements out there. Many of you will be taking them. Uh, they're all about a pound a day or 30 pounds a month. Um, there are literally hundreds, uh, and many of you will be bombarded by adverts for these supplements. The supplements tend to contain uh, mixtures of things. Um, so there's some plant-based products. Uh, saw palmetto, which comes from the dwarf cactus plant, uh, is in these substances. Um, selenium, zinc, vitamin A, vitamin E tend to be present. Um, and that's fine. They're, they're, we think all those, those things are good, but they are probably better delivered as part of a good and balanced diet. So I would um, say, and, and this, obviously, if you want to take a supplement, you can, but actually the better strategy is to um, try and uh, have some impact on your diet. And that diet should be broad and include nuts. Brazil nuts have a lot of selenium in them. Tomato-based products, um, red peppers, etc., cetera, um, have a lot of lycopene. Um, and, and to get those nutrients through natural means, we believe is a lot better than through uh, tablet formulation. So I hope that's helpful. Um, so Kevin uh, asks about PSA. I haven't said too much about PSA so far, other than it wasn't a great strategy uh, when combined with um, biopsy uh, as a screening uh, method. In fact, it wasn't a great strategy um, when combined with biopsy as a diagnostic strategy. So historically, if you presented with a high PSA, um, most men then went on to biopsy. There was nothing else that we had available that could discriminate men with clinically significant cancer versus men without. Um, that biopsy was not targeted to anything because we didn't have anything that told us where the cancer was. And those biopsies went throughout the prostate. We know that it was very inaccurate. And we know now, we didn't know then, that many men that had prostate cancer had their diagnosis missed because the biopsies just weren't sent to the right part of the prostate. And we now know that a lot of the cancers actually um, evade that type of sampling. So when you um, biopsy randomly, you tend to miss the anterior or the front part of the prostate in the midline that sits behind the urethra. It's just anatomically very hard to get at. And we now know that 20, maybe 30% of cancers sit in that anterior zone and we're just beyond the reach of original biopsies. So we told men that they were clear uh, when indeed they were not. And of course, um, these days, um, when you combine PSA uh, with an MRI, 
uh, you've actually got information on location and the MRI will tell you exactly where the cancer is likely to be and we can direct um, cause to it. If those biopsies come back negative, we tend to repeat the MRI in a year just to make sure. And if there's any growth or increase in size of the lesion, we'll offer rebiopsy. So very, very few men with clinically significant disease will now have their diagnosis missed. And that's really, uh, really important in both a diagnostic uh, risk stratification uh, setting, in other words, what we do in hospitals, uh, and also in a screening setting, what we might be doing in the community uh, in the future. So let's see um, if there are any other questions. So um, sticking to um, screening again, uh, a good question from another uh, anonymous questioner um, uh, who asks, at what age uh, should I start prostate cancer screening? Well, um, there's no specific age, uh, there's no cutoff. Uh, everything in biology tends to be incremental. Uh, I've already said that prostate cancer is associated with age. And so if you start screening men who are very young, and i.e. less than 40, less than 45, uh, their risk is very low, and you'll have to screen a lot of men to find an individual with disease. If you um, instead concentrate on the proportion of the population where the disease prevalence is going to be highest, so men in their 60s, um, uh, maybe early 70s, um, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to screen fewer men to identify uh, the cancers that matter. What we need to do, I think, in the future is have some information to tell us a little bit about risk. And this is called stratified screening, so or risk-based approach to screening. And it may be that knowledge of um, your family history, of the genes that you were born with, um, uh, or, or of certain kind of aspects of your, of, of your life, um, or previous diseases may predispose you to prostate cancer. Uh, and it might be those individuals that are then offered uh, an invitation to a screening program. Um, AI, I've mentioned it, um, it took me a few minutes to get there, but artificial intelligence is, is being used to um, see if we can identify any features or attributes of individuals or their diseases that are more likely to be linked to prostate cancer that so far we, we, we may have overlooked. So I think, I think the future is gonna change quite a bit. Um, uh, the knowledge of the genes that you were born with, and you only have to do that test once in a lifetime. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in that to see um, whether that increases your risk and whether those individuals should be screened earlier and maybe also screened more often. So the other question that comes up quite a bit is, is at what age should I start screening? Um, uh, the other question is how often should I screen? Uh, and again, we don't really know the answer to that uh, because you can only really work out the ask, answer to that once you've done a screening uh, program and you know the yield that is generated from that program and then you can model what might happen if you reduce the screening interval or indeed increase the interval. The question that nobody tends to ask and I haven't seen it asked yet is at what age we should stop screening. Um, so there comes a point uh, in a man's life and that can be chronological uh, age or that they, um, their, their kind of health deteriorates where there's really not much point in screening because if we found a cancer, we probably wouldn't do very much um, when we uh, came across it. Um, and, and obviously, um, again, there's no specific age at which it's appropriate to stop screening, but, but there is uh, a point in everybody's life where, where that um, moment arises. So um, Kevin asks, can we trick trick biology, that's an interesting um, approach, uh, by lifestyle intervention to prevent mutation of cancer cells as we age. So this relates to my previous attempt at an answer uh, on what we can do to change the natural history. I don't think we can trick biology. Uh, biology has evolved over millions of years and I think has seen all the tricks uh, so far. Uh, we have to work with biology um, and, and you know, maybe augment the antioxidant status, lycopenes, um, maybe augment some of the uh, vitamin profiling, um, for instance, vitamin D during the winter, 
Um, these are just suggestions. I, I don't think anybody particularly knows. Uh, but understanding the biology uh, will give us interventions uh, that might I slow down the progression or indeed prevent the progression of normal cells transforming into abnormal cells that then transform into prostate cancer cells. And this is a really interesting area at present and getting a lot of attention and it's called interception uh, because we intercept um, the process uh, of change of transformation before cancers are formed. But obviously if you're going to do that uh, the intervention has to be extremely well tolerated uh, because you're not treating cancer, you're treating or preventing changes in the cells that precede the development of cancer. Um, there's currently no way that we know to prevent cancer. There's quite a lot of data on a drug that we use quite commonly in benign prostatic hyperplasia or you know, in prostatic enlargement. Um, and that's called finasteride or dutasteride. And whenever that's been studied, uh, we've seen a reduction in the proportion of prostate cancers being diagnosed in the men on finasteride or dutasteride. These are prostate shrinking drugs versus placebo. Um, and uh, we and colleagues are looking at that again to see whether those drugs which are currently licensed for BPH might be uh, thought about once again um, for prostate cancer prevention. There, there have been attempts to um, study this in a formal manner to see if we can prevent prostate cancers. Um, uh, but so far, and the results were actually probably, yes we can, um, but uh, so far none of these drugs have been licensed for use as a prostate cancer preventative agent. But I think we might see quite a bit more on that uh, in the future. So I've got, um, let's go down, and, and I've got a lot of anonymous uh, questions here. Uh, and again, um, why, don't we, why don't we move to, to, to Debbie? And I, I might come back to the anonymous just to, to get to a personal perspective on things. Uh, and Debbie tells us, and thank you Debbie for sharing this. Uh, she says, my husband's been diagnosed with prostate cancer. I'm very sorry to hear that. He had no symptoms but decided to get tested. He had a one centimeter lesion that has not spread, that's good news, um, contained within the prostate and he's got Gleason 4 plus 4. Uh, as it's very small, the question gets quite specific now, could he have nano knife as he doesn't like the side effects of other treatments? So De Debbie's husband uh, has, looks like he's been diagnosed very efficiently and very well. Clearly MRI was used early. They identified a lesion within the prostate. That lesion has been targeted. This is all state-of-the-art, latest ab approach. And Gleason 4 plus 4 has been found. Uh, Gleason 4 plus 4 is a, an aggressive prostate cancer that needs to be taken seriously. There are lots of confusing numbers and scales in prostate cancer. Uh, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with the Gleason scale, um, there are three numbers that matter. There used to be more, but for the moment there are three, four, and five. Three is the pussycat, the, the cancer that may not be cancer, that probably doesn't matter, that nobody ever dies of and never spreads. Five is the so-called tiger, the cancer that is likely to spread very quickly and often has spread by the time we've made the diagnosis. Now Debbie's husband does not have any pattern five. Uh, he's got pattern four, which is the element in between. So it's neither the low risk one nor the high risk one and is something in between. And these are, these are cancers, these are prostate cancers that can spread um, and all the cancer that was biopsied conformed to pattern four. Hence the annotation four plus four. Had there been a kind of mix of Gleason grades and Dr. Gleason was a pathologist working in America 40, 50 years ago um, then the annotation would have been three plus four, mostly pattern three with a little bit of four, or it could have been four plus three, mostly four with a little bit of pattern three. So I hope that makes sense. There are lots of other scales that we might talk about later, uh, but that's the Gleason scale. Um, so an answer to Debbie's question, this is very likely to be contained. Um, I 
Personally, if I uh, was looking after Debbie's husband, I would get another scan just to make sure that it was contained. And we would currently use something called a PSMA PET scan that is the best scan that we have available that rules out prostate cancer outside the prostate. Now, it's highly unlikely that this is spread uh, given what we know, uh, but the PSMA PET scan allows us to be sure. And we do the PET scan when, we're, when, we, when, we, when we see uh, cancer, which has these aggressive components uh, within them. Um, the ability to treat, if there's a single area, uh, and uh, this is one centimeter across, um, then yes, it's usually very possible to treat in a focal manner. And what we mean by that, and Debbie is alluding to this, is that we use an energy source and we use the energy source to kill the cells within the lesion plus a margin around the lesion. All cancers need to be treated with a margin because all cancers extend microscopically beyond the limits that you can see. And whether nanonife or cryotherapy, nanonife uses electricity, cryotherapy freezes to minus 40, which is much colder than today, uh, or HIFU, which concentrates sound waves um, and, uh, and increases very rapidly the tissue temperatures uh, to uh, make the cells uh, explode. Um, uh, it depends very much which energy source we would choose would depend where the lesion is. Uh, Debbie doesn't specify where the lesion is. Typically, if the lesion is in the front part of the prostate, we would use nanonife. If the lesion is in the back part of the prostate, close to the rectum, we would use high food. But it does look as though he is eligible uh, as long as the PSMA PET uh, was reassuring that we were dealing with disease that was confined. Now, um, Debbie does say that there's no spread, so it's very likely that uh, Debbie's husband will have already uh, had either a PSMA PET scan uh, or a bone scan. So Debbie, I, I really hope that helps. And the reason Debbie's asking that question is that if a man is eligible for focal therapy and does need treatment, uh, we can treat them with much um, less in the way of side effects. So the risk of incontinence virtually disappears and about 90 to 95% of men will keep erections sufficient for penetration, assuming the erections were okay before treatment. Uh, the other thing we tell patients is that the um, volume of ejaculate will diminish. Semen is made in the prostate. Inevitably, when we treat the prostate, that diminishes. Some men will lose it completely. Semen tends to go anyway, definitely with surgery, and also uh, with radiotherapy. So um, that's a discussion you can have with your urologist. Uh, and obviously, this is something that we specialize in uh, here at UCLH. Um, Philip asks a question about TURP uh, as an out, is, is it an outdated treatment? Um, TURP is an operation for benign prostatic hyperplasia um, and is rarely used in prostate cancer, but it does have a role. So sometimes men present with locally advanced prostate cancer, that's disease that's spread beyond the prostate, and they're really struggling to pee, and some of them will need a catheter and in order to get rid of that catheter, we have to remove some of the tissue before the hormones uh, have the opportunity to shrink the um, prostate down. And that can help get rid of a catheter and get a man peeing again. And that's called a channel TURP. That's an unusual use of TURP, which stands for trans transurethral resection of the prostate. Uh, and it still has a very important role. Uh, its main use and it's been around for 40, 50 years now, uh, maybe even longer, is to cut out a channel in the prostate to allow men to pee much better to empty their bladders um, when the prostate has indeed grown. Um, now, it's being surpassed, and hence the question, by many other treatments. Some of these are minimally invasive. Um, and some of them do exactly the same as TURP, but use different technologies such as laser. And some of you will have heard of green light laser. Some of you will have heard of homium laser prostatectomy. Um, these essentially do the same, but they do it uh, with a little bit, little bit less bleeding and often a shorter hospital stay. And importantly, that's absorption of the irrigation and the water that we used as part of the treatment. There's a growth in minimally invasive techniques for men with BPH. Um, and these are of a number of types. Some are 
kind of pins to keep to kind of hang the prostate high to open things up. Um, there's a steam treatment uh, using vapor, uh, which um, which destroys the cells. Um, there are new laser treatments in the prostate, uh, which are coming in now, which are fairly minimally invasive. Most of these minimally invasive forms of treatment work very well. They preserve ejaculation, uh, but they do need fairly long catheter times. So the catheter has to be in to allow the tissue that's been destroyed to, to be absorbed and the swelling to diminish so that when we take the catheter out, the individual can empty the bladder efficiently. Now, there are men with prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is common. BPH is common. Benign prostatic hyperplasia is common. And so there's a big overlap between the two. And sometimes we'll, we'll do the BPH treatment first before the cancer treatment. Sometimes we'll do the cancer treatment first um, and the BPH treatment afterwards. Uh, for instance, men who are waiting for radiotherapy, sometimes the radiotherapists will ask us to deal with the BPH first to get the bladder emptying efficiently so that they don't uh, run into problems during the uh, program of radiotherapy, uh, which might require a catheter and uh, make things a lot more complicated. But that's a kind of complicated uh, discussion that uh, we would have with the radiotherapists and, and obviously let the patient know of the options and the merits and benefits of um, doing one first versus one later. It's never usually completely clear cut uh, and is a very a kind of individualized form of treatment. Um, uh, an anonymous questioner asks us about pyrads. And, and this means I'm gonna have to give you another scale. Um, and, and most scales are five point scales in medicine. We call them clinometric scores. And uh, usually five is the worst, one is the best. And the reason it's a five point scale is there's a middle ground. There's the not so sure or the sitting in the fence position. And that's usually uh, gets attributed the number three. Um, pyrads is no different. Uh, pyrads is used in MRI scoring. Um, if you have a pyrads one or two, basically your scan is normal, green light. Uh, if you have a pyrads three, the radiologist aren't so sure there might be cancer present, there could be inflammation, they can't make up their minds. Uh, so that's the amber. Um, and, and then there's pyrads four and five, where the radiologist is of the view that the probability of prostate cancer is very high, pyrads four, uh, or extremely high, pyrads five. And when they attribute a five, they're virtually certain that cancer is present. And that's associated often with about a 95% probability. And of course, that's the, that's the red light. So you can turn a five-point scale into a three-point scale, green, amber, red, which I think is kind of easier to manage. Green, reassured, nothing to worry about. Red, uh, we need to um, uh, do a biopsy to find out what this lesion within the prostate is. And then amber is the middle ground. And in, certainly in my books, that's a discussion you know, and it's a discussion about how much certainty the patient wants. Uh, are they willing to wait? And we have two options when we have AMBA. Uh, we can use time and repeat an MRI scan in a year and watch the PSA during that time. Sometimes the AMBA lesions go away, which means there were inflammation. Um, other times they get bigger or more intense, which probably means they're prostate cancer. Or um, if the PIRADS-3 or AMBA uh, is represents a lesion, you can you can go straight in and biopsy it. But the yield, i.e. the probability of finding clinically significant disease in PIRADS-3, uh, or AMBA disease as, as, as we might call it, is much, much less. And we sometimes use other features to kind of help us decide. Um, the relationship between PSA and prostate volume, or PSA density, is quite useful. And if you have a low PSA density, low PSA, huge prostate, uh, then the chances of finding prostate cancer are much reduced by about five times actually, um, versus a small prostate and high PSA, which would, which would confer a high PSA density. And we're learning a lot more about 
what it is that might help us get off the fence so that we can reassure emphatically or tell a man that actually what's needed next is a biopsy. And the way we're doing that is working with biomarker companies, people developing blood tests and urine tests uh, that tell us a little bit about the proteins and um, signal that the prostate cancer can give us to help us decide whether we should go to the red side or indeed to the green side of a Pyrads 3. So I hope that's helpful. That's two scales now uh, that we've done. Um, and yes, we, we, we use that a lot. Um, Isabella, um, we've got more women questioners than men so far. So it's great uh, to see um, uh, women taking care of their, 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 their partners so well. And Isabella says, if you have HIFU and then decide to have salvage therapy, can this be less effective because you've had HIFU? So this is a really important question. Uh, the, um, the easiest surgery is obviously the first time you do surgery. Um, if you've done anything to the prostate before, it makes the surgery a little bit more difficult, not impossible and, and certainly not something that a good surgeon cannot deal with. We talked about TURP earlier. Um, a lot of men have had TURP or laser, uh, and that obviously causes scarring at the bladder neck. And when you remove a prostate, you, you remove it off the bladder neck and off the urethra. Prostate comes out and you join the bladder neck onto the urethra. Um, and, and that can make surgery a lot more difficult. Uh, previous severe infection can make uh, dissection around the prostate very sticky. Previous radiation therapy uh, is probably the hardest operation. So when you remove a prostate after radiotherapy, particularly if that's been brachytherapy, because the prostate is tiny and very stuck down. Uh, focal therapy, we have found, has remarkable little impact on the surgery. Um, and the reason is that, uh, and, and, the, and the clue is in the name, it's, it's focal. Um, and so you're treating a very, by definition, a very small part of the prostate, usually on one side. Um, and you know, let's say you're treating the left base of the prostate, uh, the whole right-hand side of the prostate, the posterior aspect of the prostate, the apical part of the prostate, I'm describing the anatomical limits of the prostate, the bladder neck, will all be normal to the surgeon. The surgeon will not know uh, there's been anything there. Uh, obviously, there'll be some scar tissue in the area where the focal therapy was done. Uh, there'll be no surprise that there'll be scar tissue there. Uh, one can see that on the MRI, and that can be part of the surgical planning. So in the published work that we've done, um, and I've worked a lot with uh, a colleague of mine called Paul Cathcart on this, um, is that the functional outcomes are really very, very good. Obviously, when you um, do anything for failure, um, so if you remove a prostate after radiation has failed, or indeed I do HIFU after radiation has failed, uh, then obviously the patient is older, the disease has been around longer, and by definition you're selecting patients who are at greater risk uh, because the cancer that they've had treated has managed to survive the first treatment. And that does change the nature of the cancer and it does change um, the overall risk associated with it. Uh, and so uh, when you do remove a prostate, can a prostate after radiation, after cryotherapy, after HIFU, after indeed any form of treatment, you're going to find worse disease uh, because it's disease that has already managed to survive the initial treatment that you had. Uh, the key is obviously uh, in all these cases is very careful surveillance. Um, the, one of the interesting attributes of um, the focal therapy cohort, in other words, men that have had focal therapy, is that they're very, very closely monitored. They are the most closely monitored group of men in the world in that they have very regular PSAs and regular MRIs. So if we do find that uh, they develop a new cancer, say, or in the first year or two develop a um, recurrence of the initial cancer, both are possible, uh, we catch it early and we can deal with it early. Most men after focal therapy uh, who fail, and there are two types of failure. Um, the first is that we haven't managed to clear it, um, and that happens early, usually in the first couple of years, peaks at around 18 months. Uh, most men choose to have a retreatment, and I think that's perfectly reasonable, and we can do that safely and reasonably effectively, with about a 70 to 80% chance of being free of disease at five years. 
Um, the other form of failure is that another cancer develops. And this would be the same as a woman who has a left-sided breast cancer treated. She still has mammography on the right, and then maybe five years later is found to have a second cancer. Um, and in fact, that's the case in all cancers. You have, you have your colon cancer, you still need a colonoscopy every four or five years just to check on everything. Um, you have your kidney cancer removed, you still need the other kidney checked. So that's, that's commonplace. Uh, we think that risk is relatively low, and we're trying to find out the kind of determinants of the individual and the prostate and the cancer uh, that makes it likely for that individual to develop a new cancer. We don't really know the answers to that yet. So I, I, hope, I hope that's helpful. A very long uh, response to a very short and very excellent question. Um, let's try um, this one. This is anonymous. This is because um, it brings a personal perspective. Um, uh, this anonymous questioner tells us uh, that he was diagnosed with Gleason 6, so prostate cancer. That's Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6. So this is all low-risk prostate cancer. When we see that, um, which is great, I already said, those of you um, recording this will be able to say that uh, nobody, I said, nobody dies of Gleason 6. Gleason 6 never spreads. Those statements I believe to be true. Uh, the trouble is that often, for the reasons, again, I said earlier, um, people with Gleason 6 might have some more aggressive disease elsewhere in the prostate. But let's, let's, let's read on. So I was diagnosed with Gleason 6 cancer in two of 24 cores 20 months ago. So what we're hearing there is that only two of the needle deployments of 24, which is a lot, 12 on the left, 12 on the right, uh, that's a lot of needle deployments, um, contained low-risk prostate cancer. This looks favorable. Um, if you biopsy men you, you, you know, of a certain age, you, you are going to find low-volume Gleason 3 plus 3. Um, uh, I usually ignore it when it's found as long as the patient has been very well um, assessed uh, using PSA, MRI, and biopsy if biopsy is being done. So let's, let's learn a little bit more about this individual. So the, the PSA ranged from six, from 5.1 to 5.9 in 2022, and then 6.1 in 2023. That's quite a jump. We would normally expect PSA to rise by 0 0.2 micrograms per liter per year. So if you watch a group of men age, on average, uh, the PSA will go up at that very slow rate. So it'll go up one point over five years on average. Everybody will be slightly different, but if you, that's the average rate. This is, this is a PSA rise that we would see in five years happening in one year. So this is a significant rise. It can still be due to random variability and it might not be prostate cancer related, uh, but it's a significant rise. And here's the question. Would your advice to be to wait and watch or to have preemptive intervention. Um, I am in my early 60s. So uh, if this were me, I would want to be sure that the Gleason 3 plus 3 equals 6 was all I had. And I would be very, very comfortable if my MRI showed a normal picture, Pyrads 1 and 2, green. Um, and if I, I would be very happy to live with small amounts of Gleason 3 plus 3 if my MRI were normal. Um, now the PSA, uh, I think, will probably relate to the prostate volume. I would, sus my suspicion is uh, that this individual has probably got a large prostate, 50 or 60 cc's. The PSA density is normal. So if we divide the PSA by the prostate volume, we get 0 0.1. And that, and that the Gleason 3 plus 3 is a chance random finding. Uh, but he does need to have a high quality uh, normal MRI uh, which confers low PSA density to get there. Now we can flip this round to today. So um, if this individual had a 50cc prostate and the PSA was between 5 and 6, which it is, and the MRI was negative, I wouldn't do a biopsy. And so um, I wouldn't know about the Gleason 3 plus 3 because I, I don't think it matters. Um, and this individual would not have the burden of a cancer diagnosis and the worry that he's clearly expressing. 
Uh, and we can do that because we, we know what a negative MRI means today. And, and what we're trying to do is when it's safe to try and reduce the incidence of this low risk prostate cancer, uh, which we believe to have no or very, very little clinical relevance over a lifetime. So um, I don't know your name, but um, thank you very much for that question. And thank you very much for sharing uh, your, your own personal perspective. I, I do hope this works out for you. Um, as again, my reading of this is that you're probably pretty safe, but just make sure uh, you get that high quality MRI and make sure that it's completely normal. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, let's have another personal perspective. Um, again, this is uh, anonymous. Um, and this individual um, tells us that he's 69 uh, and the PSA level is 5.4. Um, the prostate is known to be enlarged, though we're not told how big it is. Um, the MRI scan has been done uh, and it will tell you the prostate volume, which is, we just don't know what it is. Uh, he was offered a biopsy and he declined it and the PSA level is stable for at least a year now. Am I doing the right thing, he says. And again, the answer is very similar to last time. It, it depends. Um, if the prostate volume is, you know, 50 to 60 mils, his PSA is 5.4, um, and it returns normal signal, um, I would recommend to him, and indeed if it were me, I would not have a biopsy. Um, and that, I think that's a perfectly safe thing to do, and would only biopsy if the PSA goes up or an abnormality um, is, uh, develops in the prostate. Um, and so the question that this individual must ask his doctor is, is there an abnormality in the prostate? And if there is, I would suggest one of two things. It either needs a biopsy to find out what it is, not everything we see is cancer, or the lesion needs to be followed up. And we currently think, think that lesions are relatively safe if they are stable. Um, but if they start to grow, uh, that obviously shows that the cancer is progressing uh, and that may be, maybe, we're not quite sure yet, associated with further risk such as metastatic spread. Um, and so the contents of the MRI are important. The quality of the MRI is really, really also important. We might have a question on that later. Um, and depending on what the MRI shows, will indicate whether or not further MRIs need to be done downstream. So um, I'm told that um, the, there are some sound problems. Some of, the, uh, some of you attending here, and thank you for joining us for this uh, quest live question and answer session uh, today, uh, are having problems hearing uh, everything that we're discussing. I apologize for that. Um, just to let you know that this is gonna be recorded uh, and so you'll be able to retrieve the recording and listen to it on a different device um, in, in, in your own comfort and be able to repeat uh, some of the areas that perhaps you missed. And I apologize um, if, if you missed any of it. Um, now, Becky. Um, Becky, I'll, I'll read this. Um, so thank you for the study. I'm not quite sure which study she's alluding to or, or Be Becky is alluding to at present. Um, this has understandably brought some anxiety. For example, my father, age 65, who had normal findings from his two blood tests and a prostate physical examination, he's very keen to undergo a private MRI for peace of mind. Uh, would you advise this? And if so, would a normal MRI be sufficient? Or should this be a multi-parametric MRI? Thanks so much. Okay, so uh, really good question, Becky. Uh, you're clearly keeping up on the literature. Um, Becky's question addresses a study that we published very recently from a study called Reimagine. Uh, it had a huge amount of press interest and, well, for two reasons. It was the first time that we offered MRI to the community um, in men that had not had a PSA beforehand. Um, and this was something called a random invitation. So. We went to GP practices and men were randomly selected, the play of chance, and, and they were selected. And then we would write to them, do you want to come and have an uh, you know, MRI prostate health check? And that's the first time 
that we've, we've actually done a representative sample from the community. And we did that to try and work out what the prevalence, so the, in other words, the amount of lesions that were out there um, that, um, that perhaps we hadn't found using existing methods. And so um, the, the study went very well. It started just before COVID stopped and then restarted afterwards, but it, um, it, it, uh, it really recruited very well. Men, men were very, very keen to take part. Um, when they did arrive and had their MRI, and Becky makes this point, it was a short sequence scan. It was a 10 to 15 minute scan rather than a half an hour scan. I'll, I'll explain that a bit more in a minute. Um, uh, they, we did a PSA at the same time. And, and of course, we were able to analyze the MRI result uh, in, in all men, because they'd been invited, uh, men between a certain age band, and, and, and also have knowledge of their PSA. And I think it was the fact that um, over half of the cancers that we identified in that study uh, had a normal PSA. So it had a PSA of less than three micrograms per liter, which in the UK is definitely normal. Often four micrograms per liter is used as a cutoff. Um, and, and that was a real surprise. It was a huge surprise for us, uh, and it was a huge surprise for the world. Um, and of course, this wasn't known beforehand because uh, all MRI biopsies and stuff had always been done on men with a high PSA. So um, if your PSA was normal, uh, you'd just be told it's normal and you, you wouldn't get referred. So we had no idea um, what was happening uh, in the prostates of those men. So this, this really does change things um, and, and does show that um, clearly, well, we know this MRI is an important component of the diagnostic pathway, uh, but actually we may, we may need to offer MRI at much lower levels of PSA. Uh, and I suspect that's probably the answer is to reduce our threshold, make MRI shorter, quicker, cheaper, less harmful, more of that in a second, uh, and therefore we can offer it to more people. So, so to Becky's question, which is, um, can I really trust the PSA? I'm paraphrasing Becky. Uh, I think our study shows that the answer is no. Um, that a low PSA is, 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 not, is no longer uh, assurance that you are free of clinically significant prostate cancer. Um, now, if your PSA is less than one, uh, the likelihood of having clinically significant prostate cancer goes down significantly. So there's probably very little merit in scanning men whose PSA is greater than one. But what I think we're gonna have to do is lower the threshold um, and obviously, if um, Becky's father wants to have an MRI, I'm sure he can get it done. Um, and, 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 and I'm sure that will be part of the pathway uh, in, indeed in the future. Um, now, these, these quick scans are important. Um, the multi-parametric MRI that Becky refers to is the, is the, is the long scan, uh, which typically has three components. Going to get technical now. T2, which is the anatomy, diffusion, which measures the movement of water, and the gadolinium scan or dynamic sequence, which measures the blood supply. And obviously we use each of those sequences to discriminate healthy normal tissue from cancerous tissue. And they all work together. You know, so if they're, if they're plus on one, plus on the other, plus on the other, it's very likely to be cancer. And any other kind of distribution or plus minus has different, um, calcul has different permutations. Um, what we've done for the screening scan is to take away the gadolinium component, the dynamic component. That's the one that takes time, requires an injection. And because you're being injected with gadolinium, you need a doctor present in case you have a reaction to it. That makes it really expensive. If you get rid of that, the scan becomes a 10-minute scan, um, and you don't need a doctor present, so you can do it anywhere. You can do it in a supermarket, on a lorry, and the costs just dramatically fall you don't need to buy gadolinium. Um, and, and importantly, because there's no injection of anything, um, there's, there's, there's no harm done to the individual because it's an entirely passive uh, process. Uh, all the man has to do is lie in the scanner. We don't think that um, the magnetic field is harmful. Uh, you know, fetuses can have an MRI scan. Uh, it may be that injecting gadolinium is harmful. We just don't know yet. 
So getting rid of that as part of the sequence is really, really important. And if we do ever have screening with MRI, it'll be in this short form um, method, down to 10 minutes and maybe even down to five minutes if, um, if, if some of our sequence development, in other words, we're trying to work on new sequences uh, that can be done even quicker um, and with, with, um, with less infrastructure. Um, and if we do that, more and more men can benefit um, from earlier diagnosis. So Becky, um, I hope that helps your father. So the, my answer to your question is yes. Um, I can't re reassure anybody un until I've got a normal MRI scan. And I think our data uh, strongly supports that. We're getting coming to the end uh, of, of this um, live Q&A. Thank you for your fantastic questions. Uh, these have really been superb um, and so far have addressed diagnosis, screening, biology, um, personal kind of dilemmas, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, let's see if I can find a, another question. Um, okay, here's a kind of international perspective. Um, let's see how this plays out. This is another anonymous question. Um, and having spoken to consultants in England, Scotland, Germany, and the USA, they recommend radical prostatectomy uh, due to a friend's young age of 46. Um, and the patient is T2. That means the cancer is confined to the prostate. N0, lymph nodes are clear. M0, no evidence of metastases. 11 millimeters of Gleason 4 plus 3, no symptoms. Why not consider something less invasive? Well, it, it all depends on location. Um, and remember, the expertise to do focal therapy varies around the world. Focal therapy is a complex intervention. Um, you, you tailor the treatment to the individual and to the cancer that you're treating. So you, your, your information has to be first class, really good MRI, very good biopsy strategy, and you have to be a master of the energy sources that you are using. Um, now, none of that is impossible to achieve, um, and it should be possible in any, any good center, uh, but, but you need everything there to align. Um, it may be that um, he has a very small prostate, and this is a large lesion, or it may be that the lesion is right up to the edge of the prostate, and they think there might be extra capsular extension and therefore they've re recommended surgery in order to be able to apply a more generous margin uh, to, to, to the prostate. It may be, uh, so it could be, there could be cancer and anatomical reasons why prostatectomy is being recommended over other forms of treatment. If this lesion is away from key structures and you can get a margin around it, um, in my book and many other people's book, he would be eligible for a focal treatment. Uh, the patient does have to know that, you know, at 46, he has 40, 50 years of life expectancy ahead of him, uh, and it may well be that he could develop a second cancer during that time, uh, and that would need treatment. And obviously, uh, during that period, um, and, and for the rest of his life, actually, he will need fairly intensive observation, just as you would after a colorectal cancer, you know, a colonoscopy, uh, or indeed any other cancer, we, we don't stop um, at keeping an eye on the host organ. Um, and obviously prostatectomy uh, treats the existing cancer and treats future cancers that might occur uh, within the prostate uh, if they are indeed likely to occur. So there may be very, very good reasons uh, why prostatectomy is the right treatment for this individual, uh, but equally um, he may be eligible for focal therapy, and if he is, he needs to get advice on it and, and make a decision based on the best evidence that we currently have available. And it may be in a 46-year-old that, that uh, management of this disease uh, might be sequenced. So you might start with focal therapy, um, and that will keep him functioning well from a urinary perspective, from a sexual perspective. Uh, he might not have completed a family, etc. Um, obviously, you would want to save sperm before having any treatment if that were the case, um, and possibly uh, might need more treatment in the future uh, if uh, he develops a new cancer. But that, that could also be described as a success, successful form of management in that you tier the therapy 
to the priorities of the individual, uh, keeping cancer control at the forefront at all times. So I, I wish your friend very well. Um, I hope and trust he's getting good advice. He's certainly had lots of opinions, um, uh, but if he hasn't had an opinion yet on focal therapy, he needs one. And the answer may well be that Haifu Cryo or Nano Knife are not appropriate for him given the location uh, of the tumor. I think we've probably got time for one more. And um, this is, yeah, Conrad. Um, I dread, and I think you speak for all men. Uh, uh, I dread the idea of a physical exam. Is it necessary or can it be avoided? I'd rather not attend an appointment than have that happen. I know this sounds silly considering the stakes. No, it's not at all silly. Uh, I think there's very little role for a physical exam. And by that, I mean the digital rectal examination. We know it's a very poor test. The finger can only feel a tiny part of the prostate. Uh, it's the prostate that sits on the rectum. The, the other bits of the prostate that go up and around and up towards the pubic bone are nowhere near the finger. So you're feeling a tiny bit of prostate. And if a man is on the large side or has a big prostate, you can only feel a tiny bit of the prostate. And moreover, uh, we can't, can't even get urologists to agree on um, the findings of a DRE. So the between observer variability of DRE is really, really low. Um, so it's, it's, if, and if a test is not reliable, it always compromises validity. Um, I think with MRI now, if you're a man at risk, you should have an MRI. Uh, everybody, I think everybody will agree with that now. Uh, that is so much uh, a better test um, than the finger. Um, you, can, you can locate the cancer, you can measure the volume of the cancer. Uh, moreover, we can agree on where it is. Uh, it serves a baseline for the future, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I see the end of DRE. I do very, very few physical exams. And the beauty about um, MRI is that it's a trousers on test. You keep your trousers on during an MRI. And I think Conrad will be greatly relieved by that. So I think on that positive note, um, and I think it's a really important way to finish, um, men have been reluctant to accept screening because they were worried about um, having a finger put in their rectum or a probe put in their rectum or biopsies done through the rectum. None of that is, is necessary anymore. Um, you know, during the biopsy process, a probe is usually put in the rectum, but we normally do that under, under conditions in theatre uh, with sedation, sometimes anaesthesia, if that's an issue. So but the finger and the biopsy through the rectum have completely disappeared. And I hope that'll be a great reassurance to any man listening who is considering uh, getting tested um, uh, in the knowledge now that they won't uh, have a finger in the rectum uh, or indeed uh, a biopsy through the anterior rectal wall. Could I thank all of you uh, for your fantastic questions? It's really, uh, sorry, I could scroll down more. The questions are just piling in now. Um, we will do this again. Uh, and I've really enjoyed uh, addressing your questions. Uh, we'll have a recording available for you so you can go through this at your own pace uh, with family members. You can repeat it if I've spoken too fast or been unclear about certain things. We'd love feedback from you uh, about how useful you found this, how we can improve the session. Uh, and uh, I promise you that we'll read it and uh, use it to make the next one more to your liking. Thank you very much.